So hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I am not Julia Stash. I'm really sorry. She's not able to make it tonight, and she sends her regrets. Um, I am Jen Humke. I am a senior program officer in MacArthur's Journalism and Media Program, and I have been the person who's been leading on organizing this event, so that's why I'm up here tonight. Um, but yeah, so thank you for being here and joining what promises to be a really compelling conversation about how the media and storytelling influence the way that we think about citizenship and being an American. Um, our two guest speakers, Rami Nashashibi of the Chicago-based um, Inner City Muslim Action Network and Jose Antonio Vargas, who founded the national organization Define American, are two, Amer are two MacArthur grantees doing work to recast recast public norms and perceptions about, citizen, about citizenship and belonging to this great American experiment we are all part of. So I know Julia would want me to say a little bit about the journalism and media program, which is easy because I am part of that program. Um, so uh, MacArthur has invested in media for more than three decades. The first grants were made in the 1980s, focused on supporting independent and diverse perspectives on broadcast television and documentary film. And this was done to ensure that there were a multiplicity of voices and viewpoints uh, contributing to public debate and represented in the media. And of course, over the last 30 or 40 years, the media in the world has, has changed dramatically and evolved, um, introducing new opportunities and at the same time, new challenges. Um, but uh, you know, MacArthur, through our grant making and as an institution, we, we continue to hold strong to the fundamental belief that a high functioning democracy is dependent upon well informed and engaged American public. And today, our journalism and media program makes grants totaling a little bit more than 25 million each year to support nonfiction storytelling investigative and accountability reporting, and participatory citizen-made media. And I use that the term citizen in the broadest sense of the word to include everybody who lives in the United States. So in the cultural sense, not in the legal sense. Um, investments are designed to strengthen our democracy by supporting just and inclusive narratives that inform, engage, and activate Americans to build a more equitable future. And a priority in this grant making is to ensure that all Americans, especially those from historically marginalized groups, are able to uh, have their voices heard and help us work towards a more inclusive and pluralistic American society. So now I'm going to really channel Julie because I know she's going to want to, she would want me to say a little bit about why we're thrilled and we think that it's really important to be having this conversation here in Chicago um, and, and now in this moment. So. Um, over the past 40 years, well, and I should say, so Chicago is, of course, our hometown, and Chicago is also, it's another grant-making priority of the foundations, and over the last 40 years, we've invested more than $1.3 billion in Chicago organizations and individuals to strengthen the city's civic infrastructure and build more vital and healthy communities. And we think that this conversation in this city right now is timely, relevant, and really not accidental. Um, Chicago residents have been at the center of a number of efforts pushing for new norms and narratives around citizenship. So Chicago is where the Dreamers movement to advocate for the rights of undocumented youth took root. Chicago has been front and center in, a, in the national movement to change the narrative about gun violence in the unfair and often false media representations of the communities most affected by that violence. And as a sanctuary city, Chicago is part of a national movement to recast the negative and inaccurate narrative about undocumented uh, Americans from one in which they are cast often as criminals to one that includes them as contributors to our communities and neighbors that we count on. And this weekend, of course, um, and I know Jose is going to talk about this a little bit, and you should have a flyer in your programs, but Chicago is hosting the Define American Film Festival, and I'm sure they will get into that and talk a little bit about it, but it is, uh, I encourage all of you to go. Um, it's, they are going to be really digging deep into many of these issues over the weekend. It, there's no doubt that this work and these conversations are messy and often difficult, but as an institution, we really truly believe that it's an important part of living in a democratic society, especially one that is rapidly diversifying and always changing. Um, and I'd like to thank Jose and Rami for leading us in this very important discussion tonight. And I'd also like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Melba Lara. 
Um, so you might recognize Melba as the host of Chicago Public Radio's All Things Considered, and the voice that moderated our recent gubernatorial primary debates, in which she speaks. I know you're going to really recognize her. <laughs> Um, so Melba has been a journalist for more than 20 years, spending most of her time at WBEZ, Chicago's NPR affiliate, and other pu public radio stations across the Midwest. She was born in the Dominican Republic and grew up in Chicago, so Melba has personal experience with tonight's topic. So I want to thank her for taking on the responsibility of guiding us through this important conversation, and I want to thank you again for being here tonight. Thanks. So Melba, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you to Jen and the MacArthur Journalism and Media Program for sponsoring this uh, amazing conversation that we plan to have with you tonight. Um, and thank you for joining us on Facebook Live with the hashtag Civic Media. And after the program, we'll have a Q&A as well, so we'll get to hear some of your questions for our guests tonight. Before I introduce our more, give you more details about our two amazing panelists, I just want to let you know what we plan to talk about, what we don't plan to talk about tonight. One of the things we cannot do tonight is talk about immigration reform. We couldn't dream to have enough time to actually fix all the problems in this country about immigration. But what we do want to talk about, as Jen mentioned, is changing the narrative around immigration, giving people their own voice. How do they change the public discourse about immigration. What is an American? How do we define that? Who gets to define that? And what is the role of media and the public? So that's the direction that we plan to go to tonight. Um, before I tell you a little bit about myself, I did want to ask, is anyone here uh, with a group that actually works with immigrants? So we have a few. Is there anyone here who in their private practice or, or in, their, in their line of work works with, directly with immigrants? Excellent. Do we have any people who volunteer to help immigrants or refugees? Excellent. Do we have any students here from other countries? A few? Excellent. Terrific. Well, welcome. We're really glad and we really are looking forward to you being an important part of this conversation. So as Jen mentioned, my story is uh, pretty common for immigrants in this country. I was born in the Dominican Republic and that's that island that shares uh, with Haiti, Española. And my family came here when I was two years old. My father and my mother were trying to escape a dictator who had been assassinated. And in the chaos that followed in that country, the United States had to send troops to restore order and try to plant seeds of democracy. The good news is it eventually worked, but it took a while. And in that chaos, my parents dreamed of a safer, better life for their kids, so they came here. My father came first, like many immigrant fathers, and we followed three months later. My interest in journalism and immigration is uh, very peaked because of my own experience with my own family and where we came from. So let me tell you a little bit about these two great guys that are on the stage with us tonight. First, let's start with Rami Nashashibi, who is founder and executive director of the Inner City Muslim Action Network, or IMAN. For over 20 years, he's led that nonprofit working for social change on Chicago's South Side. IMAN's numerous programs include a community health care clinic, a training initiative that helps ex prisoners get job skills, and IMAN also produces an arts and social justice festival called Taking It to the Streets, which draws thousands of people to Chicago's Marquette Park. And the organization has just expanded now into Atlanta. Rami grew up the son of a Jordanian diplomat, and he has deep connections to Chicago. His mom was born here. He first came to Chicago on a college scholarship and later got a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. He's been named one of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world and was named one of the top 10 Chicago global visionaries. He's also the recipient of several prestigious awards, including being a MacArthur Fellow. So please welcome Rami Nashashibi. And next to him is Jose Vargas, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, an Emmy nominated filmmaker, and founder and CEO of Define American, as Jen mentioned. That's a nonprofit organization that fights anti immigrant narratives through storytelling. Some of you may know Jose's story. He won a Pulitzer Prize 
uh, while working at the Washington Post, while covering the Virginia Tech shootings in 2007. He also did some reporting here in Chicago when he worked for the Washington Post. He's received numerous accolades and two honorary degrees for his work featuring undocumented narratives. And one of the catalysts for his work began with a group of dreamers here in Chicago, and we hope to hear about that. Um, in 2011, while working as a journalist, Jose revealed in a groundbreaking piece for the New York Times that he was undocumented. He was born in the Philippines and came to the United States when he was 12 and unknowingly entered the country on false documents when he was sent to live with his grandparents. Um, so please welcome Jose Antonio Vargas. So Jose, for people who don't know your story, here you are, a young man looking to get young. A... I'm 37. Is <laughs> that young? <laughs> here you were, a young man oh. looking to get your driver's license. Yeah. And what happened at the DMV? Um, so yeah, so I was listening to Boys to Men and Alanis Morissette on my Walkman, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was 16, and my classmates were getting tired of driving me around. So they said, "Hey, get a license." So. I took the green card that my grandfather gave me and my Mountain View High School ID and I went to the DMV. And then when I went to the counter, um, the woman took my Mountain View High School ID and then my green card, she flipped it twice and she lowered herself on the counter and like, whispered to me, this is fake. Right. Um, the first thing I thought of was, oh, she thinks I'm Mexican. <laughs> Which happens a lot to you. But because I, was, I grew up in Mountain View in Silicon Valley, and whenever anybody said anything about fake papers, the newspaper, the radio, the television, all they said was this was about Mexican people. And then I actually said to her, no, I'm Filipino. You know, we just have Spanish names. I'm not Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and went, I don't care. This is fake. <laughs> don't come back here again. Um, and you know, without even realizing it, she was really the first part of like, you know, I've been calling it, and I say this with a lot of respect to African American history, I was an African American studies major in college. Um, you know, she was kind of the first member of this underground railroad, right, that she could have reported me. She could have like totally called somebody, and she said, don't come back here again. I thought she was lying, as I said, and when I, but when I got back to my house, my grandfather, um, was there because he would work the night shift, so he was always around during the day. And he confirmed that it was fake. And then that's how I found out that I was set here illegally, that the guy who took me here, who I thought was my uncle, but I'm Filipino, so everybody's an uncle. Like, <laughs> um, so she, he was a coyote, um, and my grandfather spent $4,500 buying these fake papers. And which is a lot of money for a guy who was making what, seven, seven, six dollars an hour as a security guard? Mm -hmm. But his plan was get me here, marry a woman, <laughs> work under the table jobs, and poof, right? And so around that time, when he told me I was here without papers, I told him I'm gay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you like an easy life. <laughs> You know, my rationale was, wait a second, so I was brought here on a lie, and now you want me to lie some more. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I have to tell you, Ellen DeGeneres played a big role in that. Like, I, meaning, that was around the same time when Ellen was on the cover of Time Magazine, mm -hmm. right? You remember that cover? She said, yep, I'm gay. I'm like, who is this woman? Why is she smiling? <laughs> and, why is she and why is she telling the world that she's gay? So she without probably even really knowing it, liberated countless people. So that gave me like, you know, the courage to tell my grandfather, the man who provided for me, look him in the eye, and I said, you know, bakla ako, I'm gay. And of course that complicated. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I want to jump a little bit ahead to when you were getting your job at the Washington Post. Yeah, yes. And you had to have a social security card? Yeah, a... well you needed, um, what they needed more was a driver's license. Driver's license. <laughs> and by the way, it was a job between the Chicago Tribune and the Washington Post. I was thinking, I'll go to the Washington Post for six months, then I'll go to the Chicago Tribune. Because <laughs> when I was growing up, the Chicago Tribune was like, remember my best friend's wedding? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there was, there was that scene. Was like, <laughs> I was like, the Chicago Tribune, you know, there's a lot of Filipinos here, why not? Um, 
So the Washington Post said, I need a driver's license, and this was 2003. Thankfully, at that time, we had Google, and um, I was Googling. I literally researched for seven hours at the library um, which states would give people like me licenses. At the time, it was Oregon and Tennessee. And through the help of other members of my Underground Railroad, um, I found somebody who lived in Portland, Oregon. I had all of these people send me mail to that address in Portland, established residency in Portland, and then got the license. And that license was valid for eight years. So without that license, I would not have had a career in journalism. That was literally the, my only, which is why I'm so glad that you mentioned immigration reform. Never mind that, if in this, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> if, if in this country right now, if what we did was to provide every undocumented American and resident a driver's license, you know, only 12 states, including Illinois and D.C., allow us to drive, right? Mm -hmm. Most states do not. New York does not. Texas, 1.8 million undocumented people in the state of Texas, right? Can you imagine how many people don't even have that one piece of ID? Mm -hmm. So without that ID, I would not have had a career in the Washington Post. And the ID expired literally on the day of my 30th birthday. So I thought I had eight years to do everything I thought I needed to do to earn this American citizenship. Um, and if I did, then it would fix itself, but it did not. So when I was about to turn 30 seven years ago, the question was, do I stay? What does staying mean? You know, I'm much more comfortable um, asking questions than answering them mm -hmm. as a journalist, right? Or do I leave and self-deport, Mitt Romney style, before he came up with that term? <laughs> Clearly, I decided to stay. And with staying, how do I use every skill I know, writing, making documentary films, to, to make sure that people understand that my story is just one of 11 million people? I want to ask you about the YouTube video of Dreamers. Yeah. There, were, there was a YouTube video of Dreamers here in Chicago that made an impact on you. Yeah, this was like... I was at the Washington Post at the time, I was a political reporter. So just imagine, I was in the closet about being undocumented, driving around following Sarah Palin, right? Um, at any point thinking they're gonna find out that you know this dude who's Asian who has a Latino name is not even supposed to be here. Um, I was paranoid and I was at the, my office in DC and I saw this YouTube video of these undocumented people in downtown Chicago saying that they were undocumented, unafraid, and unapologetic. I was like, well, do they have lawyers? That was my first question. <laughs> the second question was, what do you mean unafraid? You know, like, I spent all of my teenage, all of my 20s being scared. The last thing really got me was unapologetic. Mm -hmm. I have been sorry all my life. I'm sorry that my grandfather lied. I'm sorry that it cost $4,500 to make that lie a reality. I'm sorry that I have to lie to every employer I ever had and to all my friends who are like, hey, I'm gonna get married to Mexico, Jose. In Mexico, you should come. And I'm like, uh, you know, I don't wanna go to Mexico. And, you know, all these lies you have to tell, right? Like the lying and the culmination of all the lies you have to tell just so you can exist. It takes I'm a sorry toll. for all of it. it. Takes a toll. And so when they said unapologetic, I was like, what? what? So that, was, that happened here in Chicago. Um, and of course, that's part of the larger movement that's now been known as the dreamer movement in this country. Now, I was a dreamer before there was a dream act. So I'm like an older, <laughs> we call ourselves elder dreamers. Uh, and you're so I'm in the elder dreamer part. You're actually on the cutoff point for DACA, aren't you? I missed you're... DACA for by three months, mm -hmm. yeah. So I do not yeah. qualify for DACA. Well, I want to bring Rami in here um, because we want to hear your story too. You actually were pretty a-religious when you got to DePaul here in Chicago and you were studying here. But then things changed when you had conversations with people that were here. Yeah, I mean, so for me, my story in Chicago is always a complicated one. I mean, you know, I think a lot of us can, you know, uh, relate to the question, where, where are you from? Because uh, my, my mother, in fact, wasn't born here. She, she was born in May of 1948 outside a dirt road near Bethlehem. Um, uh, as her mother was fleeing. Mm -hmm. I was joked that my mom had the very typical biblical birth. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, and, 
and literally they were packing up, they were fleeing. As many of you know, the history of that region, that was an extraordinarily tumultuous moment. It was the birth of the State of Israel, and it was also the creation of over 700,000 Palestinian refugees, of which my mother's family was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they interestingly became one of the first group of Arab American, Palestinian Americans to settle on the south side of Chicago. My grandfather, uh, who was only educated up to seven, like sixth grade, um, learned how to tinker with airplanes that the, um, while he was just a person, you know, young man on the flight field of the Royal Air Force by the British who were during the mandate period of the mm -hmm. Palestinian uh, imperial mandate, if you will. And so he landed, he, he was able to land a job with an airline at the time called Ozark. Some of you may remember them, like they were in the Midway area. And my, my grandfather's first house was like at 67th and Stoney in uh, 1952. And um, then they, they had this interesting history with Chicago, um, which has always kind of historically kept me connected to that history because they, like a lot of, at that time, Stoney, that, that, that part of the southeast side of Chicago was predominantly and ironically, uh, kind of in, for me, think, I always think about the, the, the quote of King about us bounded you know, mm -hmm. to this uh, uh, mutual web yeah. um, that the families my grandfather was living with were predominantly Jewish Americans at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the kind of then that white flight moment on the south side of Chicago as, as, as white ethnics were fleeing kind of west uh, my, my family was in that. The second house was there in Inglewood, and then they eventually ended up in Marquette Park. My, my story was my mom met my father, who was a grad student, that they moved overseas, and I was born in Jordan, and moved around, and I was, they had a, a messy divorce, but, so I moved, I was like in 10 different schools, uh, maybe seven different countries, 11 different cities by the time I was 18. Um, and when the last country I was in was in Italy, and I, um, wasn't sure what I was going to do with myself. I was graduated from high school and had no real uh, ambition for real college, but uh, everyone around me was going to college. And I, uh, some friends prevailed upon me, you should really go to do something with your life. And, and there was a last college fair, and these guys came, and they had a brochure of Chicago. And they, you know, it, it, it was a city with, by the lake with a bunch of beautiful buildings on the cover. And I said, you know, I think I know that city. My mom grew up in that city. So I applied. And it was a college like on 103rd and Pulaski. No, yeah. no lake, no. no buildings. And I ended up there. And, uh, and then I just, and then I moved. And, and uh, I said, I got to get out of here. It was the first year. It was like around the Gulf War time. And already I was encountering issues around race that although my mom and I had an American point of reference, I had never really encountered because I would never really lived in the United States as a, as a young adult. And um, I had some ugly encounters um, that made me say, I gotta get the hell out of here and, and went to the first school I could get to and that was DePaul. Mm -hmm. And at the time, yes, I was very a-religious, if you will. My, I wasn't brought up in a religious setting, but I think three things eventually really drove me to eventually get back involved in the type of work I was doing. And, and one of them was, you know, although I was brought up very disconnected from any religious identity, I, I was always aware, and you cannot but be aware of kind of a political identity mm -hmm. as a child of refugees and Palestinian family. Um, and so I was very attuned to political social <coughs> justice issues mm -hmm. and became very involved with uh, organizing with black and Latino students and um, forming alliances and coalitions and um, dealing with everything from racism on campus to gentrification and, and displacement in and around Lincoln Park at the time, which as you remember, mm -hmm. even at that time there was a larger Latino community there. Um, and then the second thing I always, you know, at some point as a, as a kid I get infected with the hip hop bug and my first point of reference with a lot of American culture was intensely, you know, as a young teenager through hip hop, through groups like Public Enemy and so the sensibility of popular culture, the sensibility of social justice, and eventually faith and spiritual identity um, as it really manifested here was something that began to intrigue me mm -hmm. and I was being confronted with. It's something I, I don't think I would have ever had any interest in outside the United States, but it's when I found the way in which Muslim identity, particularly in the black experience, 
had expressed itself both in social activism and in hip hop culture was something that eventually kind of, you know, informed how I thought about myself and informed my activism eventually as well. And we can't really talk about immigration without talking about the water we're swimming in. We have the Trump administration who's been taking a very hard line against immigrants with the DACA, the Dreamers, also banning people from coming here from Muslim countries. Do you think we focus too much on Trump and how would you say it's affecting your communities? I mean, you've talked to Paul Ryan. His yeah. parents are immigrants, from his Ireland. grandparents from Ireland. Mm -hmm. You know, are we focusing on the wrong person? I think it's, um, it's been fascinating in the past, what, more than a year now, from progressives in particular, who are like, we have an immigration crisis in this country. And the only question I can ask is, where have you been, yo? <laughs> <laughs> like, Right? I mean, if it wasn't for President Clinton, right? So I've been in this country since I was 12, so 25 years. Um, if I leave, I would face a 10-year bar, right? Um, before I can even try to come back. Um, so that is because of what President Clinton signed into law in 1996. Mm -hmm. um, President Bush, after 9-11, when Muslims and illegals became like the other in America, shut down INS and it became the Department of Homeland Security. Um, we have a rogue ICE system in this country that every day in this country, 34,000 people must be in detention in a bed quota. Did you guys know about that? Your tax, by, your tax dollars, by the way, pay for that, right? Um, I can't not be in Chicago and not talk about President Obama, right? That has de what, deported three million people throughout, not me. I don't know why I did not and have not gotten deported. Um, you know, I covered President Obama in, you know, when I was a political reporter. It's not like he doesn't know that I'm here. Um, Jose, so, isn't there a warrant for your arrest? Well, I, after I got arrested in Texas three years ago, they issued me this notice to appear. But I think it's really important that we connect the dots, that this has been an absolute bipartisan mess that has cost us billions and billions of dollars because we are unwilling to face truth and we are unwilling to ask harder questions of ourselves, right? Um, even, even the reality that we don't discuss the root causes of migration, right? And what we as a country have done, foreign policy, economic policy, the drug war, NAFTA, right? I'm Filipino. Again, there's a big Filipino population here. Like, the reality is Filipinos are in this country because the United States was in our country in the turn of the 20th century during the Spanish-American War. So, this is a hard conversation, and yet you have, for the most part, a media ecosystem that sees this issue as illegal, legal, Republican, Democrat, conference immigration reform. And, and I want to talk about the media because they're certainly worth examining a lot closer, Absolutely. but I wanted to ask you, Rami, what has been the effect in the communities that you're serving as they see this atmosphere that's coming out of Washington? Yeah, well. So, and, and I want to maybe answer that by also the, the previous question, I think, you know, just to, to continue off that line of analysis, because I, I, I do think we don't want to underestimate the extraordinary impact that this discourse is having yeah. uh, today uh, in Kansas. Uh, three men were tried and convicted for uh, plotting to blow up a residential housing center um, of uh, Somali uh, refugees in Kansas, in Wichita, that was a, a group around 300 families. Uh, you read their transcripts in court, they're deploying language that is almost verbatim coming out of the discourse that's coming from the highest officers of the land now. So I don't think we should um, underestimate how, uh, how extraordinarily uh, um, impactful this is having, uh, the, the, this is, this is, you know, uh, what this is causing for communities in terms of just pain and terror. But to Jose's point, you know, uh, our brothers and sisters out of First Nation communities often begin mm -hmm. uh, gatherings by reminding us what land we're on. Yep. And and I think it's, you know, apropos for a conversation like this that to remind us we're sitting right now yep. on the stolen Potawatomi land, and. And I think that's not, un that's not just making a politically you know, conscious point for the sake of making it. I think that is an important part of yes. this larger conversation. You know, who's here? Who's fled? Right? Who's Why? home is this? Mm -hmm. 
whose discourse, who was an immigrant, who was white, who, you know, all of this language. We were talking yeah. earlier in the green room about how I, I think the danger of focusing exclusively on the Trump area, or if you can go back to Bush or Clinton yep. or Obama, but we have to go back, as you did, to, you know, moments like the Spanish-American War, or moments early in the 20th century when, you know, things like the Immigration Act were being passed into law in great part by the hysteria that was being caused across the country around questions of race mm -hmm. and questions of purifying yep. the American gene pool. I mean, this was language that was not only bipartisan, it was being uh, articulated by some of the most well-respected philanthropists of the land. I mean, from Carnegie to Rockefeller, you could go to major institutions and find the conversation happening, and it informed not only conversations about race that led to you know, in this particular case, and this, a lot of this data we were referencing yeah. in a book that came out last year called Imbeciles, talks about how Adam Cohen, a journalist, talks about how this led to the forced sterilization of over 70,000 women in the United States of America, black, brown, and poor white, many of whom were probably the grandmothers and aunties of the Tichy Torkers. You know, <laughs> yeah. when you think yes. about yes. who in Charlatan. claims, in yes. Charlatan, mm -hmm. like, you know, who, when we forget this history, and we begin to not realize who has been traumatized, who's been really terrorized around this, these narratives, around immigration, around, around race, um, I think we then have a very myopic conversation. And I think the danger of talking exclusively about Trump is that we don't connect those dots. And we, we need to connect that. We need to recover this history. We need to recover uh, it, notions of intersectionality. It's not just a sexy buzzword for the current moment. It's a real part of our history. And we need to think about how conversations about racial identity, immigration laws, have really been entangled with one another. And in order to get out of the mess we are in, we're going to have to do a little bit of that disentangling. Well, when we feel the historical weight of how we got here, how do we actually bring in the voices of immigrants? How do we get their stories heard? I mean, for us, you know, and this is why we're grateful to, Macar to the MacArthur Foundation for seeing this, because so much of the conversation on immigration has focused on the policy and the politics of it without understanding how stories play a central role in really liberating not only the political kind of mess that we're in, but validating people's experiences and existence, right? So for example, when you go to our website, which I know that you will, because you're going to find out about the film festival, um, we actually host the, one of the largest collection of stories of undocumented people online, right? But it's not enough to collect the stories or to tell the stories. How do you operationalize the stories? Meaning, so once we collect it, how does it help a journalist in Kansas City? How does it help the writers from Grey's Anatomy, right? Like last week, I don't know if you saw Grace Anatomy last week, did an entire episode on an undocumented medical student, right? That was because Shonda Rhimes reached out to us at Define mm -hmm. American, and we sent undocumented people in the writer's room. My colleagues, um, Elizabeth Voorhees and Kristen Mar Marston here, who actually lead our entertainment division, facilitated this entire thing that went on for four or five months, just so Grace Anatomy can get that story right. Mm -hmm. So stories for us, not only liberates people from the political mess of this, but you know you can't really argue with a story, right? It's hard to litigate a story. It's someone's experience. So for us, it has to be a strategy that is comprehensive in the way we think of where people are. Now, mind you, I can spend every day, I mean, if it was up to like CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, I'd be on TV every day. But do you really need to see me on television for 30 seconds talking to you about why, why I disagree with Republicans? I would rather figure out how do we tell that, you know, how do we share stories of teachers in Alabama who happen to be Republican and who are at home wondering how do they protect the undocumented mothers of the students because the students are not coming to school because the parents don't want to have to send the kids to school because they're afraid ICE might show up, mm -hmm. right? Like, that's the role for us of storytelling. I had a mentor who teaches an after-school program in Chicago say that all the undocumented kids in that program have dropped out. And it was their one path yes. to help get into college. 180,000 undocumented people in, in, this, in the area of Chicago. Yeah, devastating. Yeah. And, and Rami, I wanted to ask you, you've talked about kind of these messy intersections in about the stories that immigrants tell about themselves and about others where you have uh, African Americans in communities where Muslim Americans own grocery stores, and you're trying to facilitate conversations between 
immigrants and people who are already here in the United States and how we have to be willing to have those tough conversations. Yeah. And, and, and to that point, and, and again, picking up on this idea of stories, I mean, I, I think what gives me the most hope and I think what should, would occupy more of our attention when we're thinking about these challenges is looking to where our pathways have demonstrated moments of success. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about the national narrative, but I, I think we should know, we should never lose sight of the power of local community Absolutely. organizing and statewide community organizing in a city like Chicago, the state of Illinois. I mean, even the driver's license victory in Illinois was a direct result of extraordinary multiracial community organizing mm -hmm. that did the type of things that, for instance, we're doing on the South Side, which is, you know, deploying the language of organizing, which is, listen, we have a common self-interest. Mm -hmm. We are all, again, we, you know, that needs to go beyond just an intellectual proposition in a very lived understanding that you are directly and intricately connected to the life of that undocumented family on that block because when their father or mother is rounded up, the quality of your life is yep. in fact directly affected because their children now growing up on that block have to subsist off the underground economy and mm -hmm. your, your quality of life is degraded because the probability of violence just increases you know, exponentially. Um, for instance, you know, we've done that with the corner stores where you know, uh, it's not uncommon to find communities of color who have been pitted against one another, you know, and this part of this language yep. of the immigrant community, immigration as being a issue that is exclusive to, you know, uh, I love your story about folks from Mexico. I mean, yeah. it's always, I remember during the Sensenbrenner uh, uh, marches here yeah. um, in 2006, we came out with a pretty multiracial group of folks, and a lot of them were Muslim, and, you know, there was one point in the march that it came time for our five daily prayers, so we stopped on the side and, and we prayed. And um, when we were done praying, an entire crowd had emerged around us and they were applauding us. And it was a beautiful moment, and it was mostly Mexicans, but, but, also, but I think part of it was that the Latino community wasn't expecting as many like black and Muslim mm. yeah. folks to be in what was looking like an almost exclusively Latino watch, right? Um, and I think we've internalized that criminal justice is a black issue, immigration is a Mexican issue. And what's powerful on the ground when you have moments, these, what I call these messy intersections, um, like a, a place like a, the modern inner city corner store provides where you have predominantly low income uh, immigrants from Middle Eastern backgrounds working in low income black communities and where those tensions sometimes are fraught with a whole bunch of problems, we've also just kind of run to the mess. And how do we yeah. challenge that mess? How do we challenge that store owner to think about their business practices and how directly connected are you, in fact, to the community that you are now subsisting off? And then we challenge the folks in the community. And we're doing this in kind of whether we're using, you know, a lot of the local hip hop artists or, uh, or activists or organizers or church clubs, neighborhood block clubs, but to, to make yes. the, uh, the, the neighbors realize, yeah, listen, you, you also are in fact very connected to the life story of this person that is in your community seven days a week. And how do we find real moments that build genuine connection? And part of that is really getting people to sit together and tell stories. What drove you here? Uh, what drove uh, black families to migrate, to migrate from the terror of yeah. the South? What drove immigrants to, to migrate to cities like Chicago from the terror of political unrest wherever they were coming from? And I think when you do that, again, you, you, you're able to create not only this very important human connection. It's no longer just an abstract headline. You know, now it's you know Mahmoud at the store. That's his story, or that's you know uh, Jose's story. Um, but you also begin to challenge us to get out of these very enclave silos notions of what is our self-interest, right. and begin to understand that we have a broader collective self-interest that will will mobilize black churches to go down to Springfield and argue on behalf of undocumented communities for driver's licenses. And, and how do we do there. that, Rami? We're, we're, we can get very comfortable in our <laughs> silos. Yeah. And, and sometimes it feels like we're preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. So how do we break out of some of those well, silos? Well, I, you know, I've been very privileged to be mentored by some extraordinary organizers in the city. And, and, and one of the lessons that I learned early on is that, you know, 
part of it is that you, you have to have what Brian Stevenson talks about, proximity to the pain. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's not hard now for a lot of our communities. Um, I think it was, um, it, it was an unspoken rule for a lot of immigrant communities, especially coming post-1965 to mm -hmm. America, who were trying their very best to quickly get on the upward trajectory of success in America. Mm -hmm. And an unspoken rule right, that a lot of immigrant communities understood was proximity to whiteness was success. Yes. Mm -hmm. And wherever you can find it, go there. Mm -hmm. And that meant, in many ways, abandoning the ability to make direct connections with communities that were suffering the most in ways that were very familiar to those immigrant communities where they left, mm -hmm. and downplaying that. I, I'll never forget a footage, for instance, of my grandfather when I was going through some of his old footage you know, growing up on the south side of Chicago, he had some of that old eight millimeter, whatever it was, film, and he had a moment with his family. He, had, in fact, built a plane. He built a Cessna plane and flew in this plane. I, 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 I definitely didn't get those genes from my guy. I, I wouldn't trust the bike that I drove. My, I always told my grandfather, like, he's, he's 92 now and still active. I said, yeah, you really actually flew in a plane that you built? He said, yeah, and he had this footage and he was showing it to me. He was very happy about it. And it had my mother and their five siblings. And he had a black friend who was him, they were trading off on the camera. And there was a moment when he was showing me that, that um, everyone's smiling and laughing and then a helicopter lands. And a big old white man comes out of the helicopter who kind of makes a beeline right towards the camera. And at that point, uh, my grandfather's African American friend was filming and you could see the camera just go black. Mm -hmm. And I asked my grandfather, I said, what happened? And he said, no, 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 never mind. He, he really wanted to change subjects. He didn't even want to show me that. And, and I said, no, no, see, I said, so what, what happened in that moment? And he said, no, no, I don't really want to talk about it. And that was like 40 years ago or 50 mm -hmm. years ago. And, and what it turned out was he came to him and said, listen, you camel jockey, if you bring this in, to our airfield one more time, I will burn down your, your plane and your house. Mm -hmm. And that type of terror mm -hmm. that immigrants started feeling just about proximity mm -hmm. to having a black friend on the yep. places like a very racialized, segregated yep. southwest side of Chicago, mm -hmm. we didn't want to talk about that. And so what I think our immigrant communities are understanding now, so for a long time, it wasn't <clears throat> the immigrant communities really didn't feel like it was in their self-interest yep. to form these alliances. Yep. And now, post 9-11, for the American Muslim community was a wake-up moment. You're not as proximate as you thought you were, mm -hmm. right? You know, you're not, you, 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 you thought you were a card-carrying member, uh, and, and your membership <laughs> has been revoked and put into question. And so all of a sudden, black-brown alliances start looking more not simply as a luxury, but as a necessity, not only for your survival, but the survival of your grandchildren and your kids and your future generations. And I think that urgency, the fierce urgency, is what drives good organizing. It's what drives good alliances. And unless you see it in, unless you've been awoken to that, to that reality, mm -hmm. that it is in fact in your self-interest, I think the type of work that you're going to do is always going to be at a distance. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to circle back, Jose, to something that you said earlier about the Charlottesville yeah. rally. How, how do you feel about the fact that now the anti-immigrant groups <laughs> have the tools to get their message out? Their, you know, their fears of law and order and <clears throat> scarcity in this country and their ability to get that message out very effectively. I'm so glad you asked that question. Actually, earlier today, the Fine American, our executive director, Ryan Eller, led this really fascinating um, presentation at the MacArthur Foundation, talking about how not only organized, but how incredibly well-funded the anti-immigrant machine is, right? So whenever you read an article um, on the, in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Chicago Tribune, or listen even to NPR, mm -hmm. um, you know, journalists wanting to seek balance, you're going to find um, the Center for Immigration Studies, FAIR, and Numbers USA quoted, mm -hmm. right? The, these are hate groups, labeled hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, that are incredibly, incredibly well-funded and incredibly well-organized to get their message out. And guess what? We live in a country where immigration policy is being run by Breitbart, 
Right. Mm-hmm. Immigration policy is being directed by people who used to work in these organizations that are now at the White House and are now running ICE and DHS. Mm-hmm. So uh, dismantling that, deconstructing that, understanding what that is, um, is incredibly, incredibly important. And working with news organizations, so when things like chain migration comes up, right, we can, we can actually, at, at, at Define American, our job that week, right, was to talk to every journalist that we can to say, can you please, at the very least, put quotation marks behind And why is migration? that important, Jose? Why shouldn't we use chain migration? Well, because this, uh, that's a very loaded, it's kind of like calling someone like me an illegal alien, right? Like this, this has been the language that the anti-immigrant right has been so good at cementing in people's, you know, mindset. And language here, you know, I'm from, a, I'm from the Maya, I'm from the Dr. Maya Angelo, like a school of like words. Um, I firmly believe that words are things, you know, they're, they're, they're in the air and then like it gets to your hair and into your shirt and before you know it, it's inside of you and before you know it, it determines how you act, before you know it, it determines how you decide things, right? Uh, in this country, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this as, as, as a gay man, I'm proud to live in a country where to be anti-gay, for the most part, right? I mean, there's still, we have still problems. To be anti-gay is culturally unacceptable. Alec Baldwin says something homophobic, he has to apologize. He has to give millions of dollars to a gay organization, right? <laughs> In this country, to be anti-immigrant, you get elected to the White House. That is a cultural shift, right? John Lewis, the great John Lewis. So I got arrested in Texas, as I said, three years ago. And afterwards, you know, John Lewis, who's amazing, um, invited me to like have a meeting. And he said, looks like you got yourself in some good necessary trouble. Like, <laughs> yes, sir. And frankly, I didn't think that John Lewis would know what I'm doing or whatever. <laughs> but he did, and I was really humbled by that. But he said, there was a time, Jose, in this country where you write an essay for the New York Times, you get on the cover of Time Magazine, you do a documentary that airs on primetime TV, you punctured culture, you've done your job. You've done all those three things at Define American, and this was like 2014, and you're not even close. Mm-hmm. Why? Because back, back in the day when Bloody Sunday happened, he said, there were three television stations, everybody listened to the radio and read the newspaper. So whatever we were going through as a country, we had a collected, collective shared narrative. Now, every morning, watch Fox and Friends. Just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> Try it, just a little bit. And then go on to the Tay Show, go on CNN, and you see precisely what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. This is why we have to be very strategic in the way we do this. And I have to say, I have to say this, as someone who's not Mexican, but always gets mistaken for Mexican. I think we owe the Mexican people of this country a tremendous apology. Mm-hmm. There are 33 million Mexicans, Amer- Mexican Americans in this country. Um, I can't tell you in all of our travels at Define America in Alabama, Wisconsin, Arkansas, how many people use the term Mexican and illegal interchangeably, right? I actually think as an Asian person, given that the fastest growing undocumented population are Asian, one out of seven Koreans is undocumented, given that in this country, 74%, I'm a journalist, I like numbers, 74% of all Asian adults in America are immigrants. Asian people are more immigrant than Latinos are immigrants. And yet when this issue comes up, where are we? And why don't we ever talk about black immigrants? Why, why are we not talking about the fact that you know, Haitians are gonna lose their status like next year? Mm-hmm. 50,000 people. Yeah. So it's important for us, you know, I have a friend who's in town for our film festival, uh, Jonathan Jace Green. He runs an organization called the Undocu Black Network. Please check it out. And we have been very, oh, is he here? Hey, Jonathan, <laughs> what's up? He's over there. Um, <laughs> The, the thing that I am most proud about our work at Define American, if you go to our website, you know, we don't do anything as much as possible that doesn't include undocumented black and undocumented Asian people. It is imperative that when we present these narratives, we complicate it as much as possible. And I gotta tell you, if I were just to count all the white undocumented people that I have met at Starbucks, <laughs> just at Starbucks. Um, I know we're supposed to be boycotting Starbucks, but you know. <laughs> If I just counted them, there's way more than 11 million undocumented people in this country, right? Because they pass, mm-hmm. right? They pass. And this is where identity and race and the notion of citizenship, mm-hmm. right, is incredibly important to like, unpack. Well, we have a few minutes left, and I, I would be remiss if we didn't actually talk about the role of the media 
obviously. Right. Um, it's pretty easy to talk about what they're doing wrong. Yeah. And, you know, we welcome that. How can we influence the media for change? I have a lot to say on this, so you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, you talked about language. Yeah. Uh, well, I, and I think both of us are, are specific about language. Even, even things when, you know, and, and I refer to some of the organizing work that's being done. I mean, there's, a, there's an alliance that we're part of called the United Congress of Community and Religious Organizations that has been very Eucro. Shout out to Eucro. You were shouting out some groups. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was, was very intentional about where organizing and, and leveraging public narrative that was coming out of media institutions mm -hmm. to make sure that even terms like uh, when you're talking about sensitivities about you know, undocumented communities, sometimes we often fall into talking about ex-cons yes. or you know, the, you know, the, the terminology there is very, uh, very important as well. I mean, we're talking about an entire subset, around 18,000 uh, people coming home every year in the state of Illinois from these prisons were also being deprived a lot of their basic rights as citizens. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so using terms like returning citizens, we have found yep. is, is language is really critical. I think I think there have been extraordinary uh, efforts by journalists um, who have, have gone out on a limb. Uh, just recently, there was an ex NPR series by Leila Fadl, mm -hmm. uh, who did a, a phenomenal job, I think, probably one of the most, uh, uh, some of you heard her work, yeah. uh, in conjunction with National Geographic, which you know I want to applaud, because think about the conversation National Geographic has been having for the last year about interrogating its own Itself. history around race and language. Yeah. I think when, the, when journalists themselves can invite others and activists and organizers into the room to say, yeah, we have, we have been stumbling on these issues. And that even immigrant communities that have been very strong yep. uh, on uh, supporting undocumented sometimes have bought into some of the more insidious racist narratives yep. affecting black folks in the United States. Yep. Uh, and, and, and that's just part of the complexity of race, identity, and citizenship. And when we can have uh, the types of reports that came out, like nationally recently by National Geographic mm -hmm. and NPR, that actually celebrate a little bit of that complexity, try their best still in, 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 in meaningful sound bites to deconstruct. <laughs> yeah. um, then I think it's on our. Uh, I think it's up to us uh, on the ground to find real powerful ways to translate that narrative into ways that can support, you know, through popular culture and organizing campaigns, you know, a little more uh, direct sustainability and effect on the ground. Um, I found that that actually can translate into not only narrative change, uh, but also policy change, which mm -hmm. is you know long-lasting yep. and can be really critical, even if it's at a municipal level, a state level, uh, or you know at, at a county level. And I think that is in you know the type of power we have when folks in the media and organizers and advocates and come together and, and challenge one another a little bit on the utility of uh, of each other's practices. So for us, a lot of it is absolutely not only on the national strategy, but the local strategy. Like mm -hmm. local television news is still a tremendous source of news for people, right? Like I've been watching television since I'm in a hotel room, just watching kind of how they talk about issues. But so for us, our job, and hopefully we get more resources for this, is how do we really help journalists who want to do this well, mm -hmm. right? Again, in this country right now, there are 43 million immigrants. I don't know if you know that. 43 million immigrants, 11 million of whom are here undocumented, excluding the undocumented white people that we haven't counted. <laughs> 43 million. <laughs> According to the Pew Research Center, this country in the next 50 years, 88% of the total US population growth is gonna come from those 43 million immigrants. We can't even talk about black people without having a panic attack. Right? Absolutely, by the way, I completely agree with you. I think unpacking the anti-blackness that has in many ways become so inherent in our communities is absolutely essential. So our job is then how do we tell the stories of this new America, right? These 43 million people that are now part of this emerging America. How do we make sure that our newsrooms are equipped to do that? And I think we have to separate though journalism from the news media from the media. We have a president that is a media creation mm -hmm. who was on the payroll of NBC, who sat, I mean, I remember after he announced he was running for president and started talking about Mexicans. What happened after? He hosted Saturday Night Live, mm -hmm. right? Like, we have a media created president. Mm -hmm. 
And he has an ecosystem that allows him to do that. So we have to be able to push back on what that is. I would love, you know, this is why we have our film festival here. We would love to figure out after we leave, because we're doing it Friday to Sunday, how do we help local Chicago journalists do a better job mm -hmm. connecting these dots and talking about race, immigration, and citizenship all together? If we accomplish that, then we have done our job. I like that you brought up popular culture because you've talked about the movie Black Panther uh, and the yeah. effect it has. It was really incredible. Like a few months ago at Define American, we got an email from this actor who's going to be here tomorrow night, actually for our film festival, Bamba John Bamba, uh, who was born on the Ivory Coast and has been here, got here when he was like 10 or 12, and he emailed us, emailed me and said, hey, um, I'm ready to come out as undocumented. I have DACA and I'm in the movie Black Panther. I was like, oh. I think I forwarded it to Ryan Eller from our executive director and then I'm like, oh my God, how do we, Noel, um, our, our, com com our communications manager. My first thing is, do you have a lawyer? <laughs> right, that was the first thing. The second thing, oh, you're ready to come out. Okay, so how do we choreograph this, right? So how do we get you in the Los Angeles Times? How do we get Entertainment Weekly to talk about it? How do we make sure every black blog, Essence Mag, all of, you know, the, the black news ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just, I have to tell you, I was so uh, thrilled that out of all the groups, he picked us. So, and then we ended up actually, because, you know, we love Black Panther. If you have not seen it, you have to, you have to go see it. We actually even created a kind of a study, like a guide mm -hmm. for how to watch Black Panther, mm -hmm. right? And connect it to issues of race and immigration. So we were really, really thrilled about that. Um, and Bamba John, tomorrow night, actually, the first thing we do, Melissa Harris-Perry, the great Melissa Harris-Perry, is gonna be here, and she's leading an entire conversation about how are immigrants portrayed in television and movies and popular culture? Mm -hmm. So that's the first conversation we're having tomorrow night. Excellent. And we have a few minutes left, just a few minutes, and I wanted to ask you if you could give us any hope. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you know, I, I think I, you know, I've, I've said this about the moment that we're in. That I think we're in a, a calling out moment, mm. and I think that's a powerful and that's a painful process, but uh, and sometimes extraordinarily uncomfortable. Um, but I think there's also a spiritual side uh, of, of our rootedness in who we are as a people that certainly I, I celebrate, and I and I've come to see in a much more broad sense, part of our larger ecosystem, whether you're talking about, again, First Nation spirituality, yeah. or you're talking about traditions that are deeply rooted here about also calling up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the calling up is also something about what we need to reclaim about the hope of America in ways that are not Pollyannish. I think, you know, <laughs> I uh, was in DC not long ago and uh, I was at the, one of these buffets uh, in the morning and I, when I checked in at Kufi and I had these groups of, Three white women. I think they're, you know, now you go to DC a lot. You for these conferences, you see the Make America Great hats again, and they were all looking at me, and and then I saw them again the next morning, and we were happy to be in the buffet line together, and they were looking at me again, and I and I said, do you mind if I ask you a question? And she looked at me. She said, I said it's about the hat. She said, okay. I said when and where. She said what? What do you mean? I said, like, no, I just, honestly, this is not an insult. I just, I want to know in your story, your personal story, when and where do you think about what date and what location do you think what is evoked when you think about Make America Great Again? And she said, she looked at me, she wasn't expecting that question. And she, you know, she said, that's an interesting question. And she said, you know, for me, she told me about a little town outside of Sacramento as a young girl growing up on a block in, in like the early 50s. And there was nothing wrong. I said, you know, I could, I could appreciate that. I said, had you ever thought that at that very same moment, life was hell <laughs> for an entire group of people, groups of people, in order for you to be able to experience that? And she said, you know, I, she said, well, maybe I'd be more comfortable with um, when she said, make America great again. It was, um, if America could be great again, right? And I thought, well, I said, if you, if, if you had that title, I said, that's something I could align with. 
because that's the Langston Hughes vision, mm. I think, yeah. of the aspirational America, America. The aspirational America uh, about letting America be the America that it is yet to become. And for me, I think the hope that I get, honestly, and I think going back to the media stories that we need to begin to celebrate goes back to the local. I'm a very hyper-local person. Stories that we see every day in our communities where black, brown, and even white kind of uh, 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 folks from all backgrounds are challenging one mm -hmm. another to make uh, uh, their neighborhoods, their communities around issues, whether it's policing or about schooling, a better America. And I think that's happening every day. And those are extraordinary inspirational stories that are not about downplaying the trauma of the moment, but they also yeah. remind us that average citizens, average people here across all backgrounds are doing extraordinary things. Uh, and many of us who are working in the community are privileged to see that every day. I know that's what gives me a lot of hope. And that is actually going to be the place where we pause for a moment. And we're going to ask uh, our audience if they've got questions. If you do, please go to one of the microphones on either side. When you do go to the microphone, if you do not want to be filmed, this part will not be included. Just raise your hand when you get to the microphone, and we'll edit you out later. This part is not going to go over Facebook Live. So if you guys would do that, and while we have folks heading to uh, the microphones that we'll have here, Jose, I wanted to ask you if you would please for a moment, oh. tell us about the film festival. Oh, yes. And you will go. You have to check it out. Um, it's the Define American Film Festival. Go to defineamerican.com. We start tomorrow night, um, and we go all through Sunday. So we have this conversation about popular culture. We're showing a film on Syrian refugees, which is even more relevant now. Uh, we're showing a film called Bisbee 17, actually about this really tragic part of history, about a, like a deportation that happened in, in the state of Arizona. Um, Paula Mendoza, who's uh, the artistic, artistic director of the Women's March, is leading a conversation here with Asian Poo, for example, um, all about like the Women's March in this Me Too era. Like, what does that look like? So this is us putting intersectionality at work. Mm -hmm. We actually have a secret screening that we can't announce because the film is premiering at our film festival from the very people who created the 13th, the documentary that Ava DuVernay made, mm -hmm. um, all about you know Black Lives Matter and kind of you know. Um, mass incarceration, that's happening on Saturday. So if you go to the website, it has all the information. And if you want, if you have a friend, a coworker, or a family member who wants someone like me deported or detained, bring them. Um, I want to meet them. Uh, we have a lot other undocumented people uh, in our staff and actually going to come. Jose Reyes, who's our artist in residence, um, is going to be there. You can ask us all the questions you want to ask about immigration. So we'll be there. All right. Thank you very much to Jose yeah. Vargas and to Rami. Nice to see you. Have to spread the word. That's good. That's good. That's a good one. Looks like we have our first questioner. Uh, just let us know if it's for Jose or Rami or both. Uh, for, uh, for both. Um, so my question, uh, and you sort of started answering this, but uh, why identify as an American today? I mean, is it for the purpose of being able to organize and have a shared story? But uh, why not double down on? being an outsider or so, a messy intersection person or whatever. So the question is why be an American today? Well, why identify? Why identify as an American today? You want to go first? Uh, I, well, <laughs> I, I, I think it's about reclamation, you know, and I think it's about, a, I think on some level it's about a, uh, a you know, an attempt to radically reappropriate yeah. and redefine what that means yes. because part of this narrative, I mean, whether it's Howard Zinn's People History of the United States, whether it's, um, there is a robust, dynamic, vibrant history of people contesting, challenging, uh, reshaping, recasting what, what it means to be American. And why, why abdicate that history? Why abdicate that legacy? We have as much right to it as any other community. Uh, in fact, in, in many, many cases, a lot of us are more deeply rooted in yep. that than those who are trying to claim it for themselves. And because that is the narrative of the moment, and because, you know, listen, those of us, and, and I'm sure we've traveled, uh, I'm sure you're a well-traveled person, when you, you know, I still think it's the, the, the best possible 
option on a lot of not so good options across the globe when it oh. comes to <laughs> our collective identity. I mean, in, you know, in, in Europe, um, the nation state identity is much more of a problematic one to try to wrestle with yeah. because its history is even more um, but bounded by a reified sense of one religious and ethnic primary identification. Um, in other parts of non-Western European worlds, we got, we're, 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 we're in really messy territories there. And I think what has been a part of the dynamic constitution of American identity here has been that legacy, has been that struggle that in fact people have bled and died for. And I, and, and I think it's a matter of reclaiming it. When I saw La, uh, in um, that moment of uh, the, the, I think it was like the 8th Calvary oh. that when they were bowing before the Lakota elder mm -hmm. uh, yep. at not far from the, uh, the, the Dakota pipeline. Um, I think that was a powerful moment of reconciliation. That was a powerful moment of recognition. Um, I think what we need to do in America is more of that, public <coughs> moments of, you know, of acknowledging our pain, acknowledging and, and publicly issuing apologies. And I think, you know, there, there are things that we can draw on from our history that celebrate that, and I think it's in our collective interest to do so. I would argue that it's not, you know, in the beginning when we started to define America, because you know how the left likes eating the left? It's like a thing, right? <laughs> we got criticized by a lot of immigrant rights groups who were saying, why American? Why so patriotic? Well, my America is like James Baldwin's America. My America is Carlos Bolosan's America. My America are the people who have to fight to be considered American. Um, I, I, think of, I think of the moment right now and the moment we're at as an absolute celebration of resilience, right? I mean, we're happy to be in Chicago. I'm happy to have grown up in California, but when you go to a place like North Carolina or Georgia and Arkansas, and the, pack, and the fact that people get up every day in this climate, Right? Yosemar started a campaign for the Fine American called Undock You Joy, which is all about the fact that we celebrate, that we get out of the house, and that we walk the dog, and that we send the kids to school, and that we provide for our families. Like, that is deeply American to me. But more than that, and I'm glad you asked this question, there are 244 million migrants in this world. This is a global issue. Right? Without even us helping anybody, like there's a teacher in Bulgaria who started a Define Bulgarian campaign, just watching what we're doing. So for me, it's about, again, this notion of who gets to be a citizen, right? And what global citizenship means. Excellent. And we have a question over here. Hi. Um, so my name is Michelle Pantoja, and I work at the Brighton Park Neighborhood Council on Chicago's Southwest Side. We work with a lot of youth that are, are undocumented, and they're more than ready to come out and share their stories to the press. But as a PR professional and as a daughter of immigrant parents, every time I hear their stories, I know how heartbreaking it is and how powerful it is, but I worry about the vulnerability of like having journalists either uh, tainted or, or like not pay attention to it. So what's the best thing I can do as a PR person to help them share their stories? with journalists. Noel or Christian, can you raise your hand over there? So can, can you talk to Noel and Chris? We would love to help you do that. Like this is precisely, you know, for us, how do you collect and tell these stories without having people feel like they're being exploited? Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That's a big one, right? I feel like all we do is like perform, mm -hmm. you know? Like I've, I've gotten to this thing now where I don't talk about my mom anymore, right? I haven't seen her for 25 years. That's all I'm gonna say. Because <laughs> I don't wanna have to like relive to you what that means. Right? Um, so, but that's the kind of training and the kind of help that we would love to provide local groups. Perfect. So please. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. And a question over here. Sure. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Thanks for your time, both of you. Um, since we're talking about narrative, I think there's such power in words. And um, especially after what happened at Starbucks, I found the remarks from the CEO very interesting. Ugh, yeah. um, and I loved how you may, you just talked about changing the narrative and the, and the the dialogue from people who were incarcerated, calling them, you know. Same thing, I stopped using the word underserved and now I use under-resourced. Um, mm. How do you feel about this new word that's being coined instead of racist, um, unconscious bias? I'm seeing a lot of that. Thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that part of the uh, Starbucks? Were you, did you just come from the Starbucks racial sensitivity training? <laughs> Oh. Um, 
Yeah, you know, I, I, again, I, I'm, I, you know, I'm very biased. Uh, I'm not, I'm very consciously biased with that <laughs> question. Um, in the sense that I think uh, organizing sensibilities is, now. Nah, let's just get into mm. the real kind of, let, let's just get, let's be real about it for a second. And I, I think sometimes, uh, again, language can insulate us from really getting to mm -hmm. yep. what is really animating and driving the pain. Um, I, I also, though, think, again, the spiritual side of me is also, in that process, we shouldn't become completely uh, and permanently desensitized to how people from different backgrounds really feel that pain and how they're affected by some of the same type of issues. You know, one quick anecdote, when we were doing the MLK Memorial on the Southwest Side in Marquette Park, and you know, this is built it, it's really a people's memorial, we were doing this march and we were getting a, uh, recreating the march of the Chicago Freedom Marchers into, into Marquette Park uh, in August 2016, commemorating 50 years of that march. I was getting a permit uh, and, and we would have this back and forth, a challenging back and forth with the police presence of the 8th District. But at one moment, there was a woman, not a cop, just kind of a woman who was a desk clerk at the, at the uh, 8th District, uh, white, uh, probably in her you know, early 60s, that said, Rami, what, what's that march commemorating? And I said, you know, Susan, it's the it's 50th anniversary of when King was in this neighborhood with the Chicago. She said, that was 50 years ago. I said, yeah, and I asked her, I said, where were you, Susan? <laughs> she said, at, she says, I was like a five-year-old girl living on 64th and Troy. That means you were living at the literally start point of mm -hmm. the march. Mm -hmm. And she said, I had two older brothers. Now I turned, because someone got my attention, I turned back and this woman was in utter tears. Mm -hmm. And I could tell that maybe that was the first time she was processing the pain and terror of a young white girl living on the southwest side of Chicago, encountering that. And my point of raising that as an anecdote to answer your question is, I think sometimes we try to insulate people from dealing with that reality for fear of really uh, offending folks. But I think everyone needs to have this raw conversation about how we've all been affected by race and white supremacy and the notions. And so, you know, some term may have some utility. Someone can make an argument for that. But I um, will always be an advocate for, let us just get into the thick of it. And let's be honest about, this is going to hurt. Uh, and, 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 but let's also be human about lifting each other up at those moments because this does totally cross religious, ethnic, racial barriers. Yep. It is about what it means to reconstitute the human family. And as a person that draws from spiritual tradition to think about that, I think about that as a spiritual conviction. You know? Thank you. We have time for one last question over here. This is actually related to the answer you just gave, but I think one of you had mentioned earlier about preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. and. My question is, how do we avoid speaking into an echo chamber, especially in a society where we have algorithms that tell us what we should be looking at? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm saying this as an undocumented gay, Asian looking with a Latino name, <laughs> who majored in African American studies who made a film called White People. So this is where this is coming from, right? I've been uncomfortable since I found out that I was this illegal in people's minds. As far as I'm concerned, all I'm doing is sharing the uncomfortability. I would argue, especially because people still use the term resistance, that you're not actually resisting if you're not uncomfortable. If you're not risking something. Like, what are you risking? Um, now, we all have privileges, whatever that may be, right? And some people have more than others. I would argue that living at a time that we're living right now, which is incredibly historic, this question of what are you willing to risk, right? And where does safety fit, right? I'm reminded, and again, I'm writing this freaking book. I was just telling Rami about it. I don't want to talk about it yet. Um, when, no, when is it coming out? It's coming out in September. It's coming out in September. Um, you can look it up. But um, 
No, uh, Harper Collins. It's oh, yeah. <laughs> Dear America. Dear America. But it's called Dear America. Are you my agent? Yeah, it's yeah. called Dear America. <laughs> but you know, when I get stuck, when I get stuck, and writing is the most difficult thing I do. When I get stuck, I see notes of a native son, I put it up, and I was stuck the other day when I was stuck in this paragraph that was taking forever to write. And I was rereading this Baldwin quote about, you know, everything now we must assume is in our hands. We don't any, have any reason to assume otherwise, right? Now if we, the relatively conscious whites and blacks and Latinos, Asians, if all of us, if we do not falter in our duty now, we may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and change the history of this world. If we do not dare anything, the fulfillment of that prophecy re recreated by songs in the Bible by former slaves are upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, no more water, the fire next time. I would argue that we are living in the fire this time. And if you are not uncomfortable, if you are not risking something, if you're not talking to somebody because I don't know, it might be too messy, you're not living and you are not being an American. So please, just you know, a little uncomfortability. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much to both of you.